Welcome to our 2022 Hudson Valley in Capital District Petal Fall webinar. Uh, I'm Dan Donahue, your Extension Specialist working in the Hudson Valley, and I'm joined in our virtual universe this morning by Mike Baisdow, who's our Extension Specialist in the Champlain Valley in Northern New York in general. Our guest speakers today are Dr. Terrence Robinson to discuss the pomology aspect, the thinning situation. We have Dr. Monique Rivera, who is our recently added uh, extension entomologist for the state out of Geneva. And finally, we have Dr. Carrick Cox, our plant pathologist also from Geneva, and he'll bring us up to date on disease uh, the issues that we should be discussing uh, at the petal fall timing. Uh, just a reminder on Zoom etiquette, we have this meeting set up as simply a web meeting, not a webinar, which means you've got full opportunity to communicate. However, with that, please make sure that your microphones remain muted. I'll have to tell you that over the last couple of years, we've heard some really interesting things from our guests uh, when they unmute their microphones accidentally. Second, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box. We'll be monitoring the chat box. Hopefully we will have uh, plenty of time for questions on today's program and still keep within about an hour time frame. Also at the very end, if we have time, then we can have questions. Uh, you can unmute and, and ask questions. So I'll, I'll let you know how that goes. Okay, very good. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, move on. Oh, I also like to, to mention that the Valent Company is sponsoring us today, and we really, really appreciate uh, their support. And with that, I would like to introduce yes. Dr. Terrence Robinson to uh, talk to us about the petal fall thinning situation. Terrence, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back here at this exciting time of the year when we start uh, really getting serious about thinning. Uh, today I'm going to focus on the petal fall timing and what I hope we can accomplish in the next few days. I want to start by reminding you that this is only one step in a multi-step process that we call precision chemical thinning. I hope that some of you and maybe many of you have already put on a blossom thinning spray of ATS at the Capital District. There's still time and I haven't run the model the pollen tube growth model for that region yet. But for most of the Hudson Valley, we're past that point of uh, putting on ATS. And so we'll focus this meeting mostly on the petal fall spray. <clears throat> I wanna emphasize that we try to time that spray based on degree days, which you can find on the Malusim carbohydrate model. And we try to time that between 110 and 130 degree days after full bloom. This is because over the years when we did this 17 year study, we didn't get very much thinning at petal fall if we sprayed before that 110. And you'll see that today in the Hudson Valley, we're about 80 degree days. So if you wait just a couple more days till you get to the 110, then we get much better thinning. <clears throat> I'd like to begin the discussion with just a sort of a summary of how I see the current situation. I thank Dan Donahue for providing me with many of the points from his travels because I have not visited the Hudson Valley this spring. But let me summarize it with noting that green tip was later in 2022 than in many of the previous past recent years. Uh, Dan gave me these dates uh, in the lower Hudson Valley, green tip around April 1st, April 2nd, and then more Columbia County around April 6th. Now temperatures after that green tip date were relatively cool until we got up to first bloom. And so that uh, made that period from green tip to first bloom about a month. <clears throat> and that's um, what is historically quite common, about four weeks between green tip and first bloom. However, since first bloom, warm temperatures have hit all over the state. And so especially in the Hudson Valley, they went from first bloom to very quickly to full bloom, and they're now rapidly approaching petal fall. <clears throat> the blooms seem to be excellent in most blocks. Um, 
we pegged, uh, with Dan's help, the full bloom date <clears throat> for Gala, let's say, somewhere on the lower Hudson Valley around May 6th, maybe a couple days earlier down in Orange County. And um, more Columbia County full bloom was pegged about May 9th. So I've used those dates in my uh, running of the carbohydrate model. Now, very surprising to me because I had earlier said there was no winter damage because I looked at temperatures and it didn't appear that we ever got to winter damage temperatures. But lo and behold, in some blocks in the lower Hudson Valley, there was significant winter damage noted. It was evidenced by poorly formed clusters that often had only one flower in the cluster or two. And then also some effect on the pistol length. And that's a little surprising to me, but it, we have to take that into account now as we do our chemical thinning. For those blocks where that winter damage occurred, I had suggested not to do blossom thinning and to wait and see what kind of set we got and then attack it in the petal fall and in the 10 to 12 millimeters range. The last point that I'll make is that there seems to be excellent bee activity, intense bee activity during bloom and no frosts have been reported. I'd like to call on Dan if he could just add any other things that he's noticed and maybe some more detail before I go on to talk about thinning. Dan? Sure, thanks, Terrence. So just a, a little additional color commentary. Uh, the bloom is, mm -hmm. I, I believe, excellent across the valley, uh, perhaps with two exceptions. And the first would be Red Delicious, and the second would be Fuji. Um, I'm not sure why Red Delicious would be a problem this year. Fuji, we had a large Fuji crop last year. And it looks like perhaps some blocks were overcropped, so you do see blank situations with Fuji. Also, in terms of winter injury, again, like Terrence said, it's a, a bit surprising down in the lower valley. And the situation is reflected in the peach bloom as well. Uh, we did suffer some injury to flower buds and peaches in the southern, in the southern valley, maybe from central Ulster County uh, down to the Jersey border we did not see this issue up in Columbia County. So that reinforces the idea that um, something happened perhaps in, in January uh, that we ended up with, with some damage. Uh, bee activity is absolutely tremendous. Uh, when I've been up in the, in the trees doing flower cluster counts this week, I felt like I was in the middle of the beehive and uh, managed to, to not get stung being surrounded by the bees, but they're all doing their job didn't care. And finally, I neglected to mention it uh, to Terrence, but um, at this point, I have uh, two sites uh, set up for precision thinning, uh, Honeycrisp and Gala, and I'm hoping I still can get two more set up today, which would be in Pink Lady and Fuji, and they're, they're in the Milton area in, in, in Ulster County. So that, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Dan. But let's go on then to talk a little bit about what is the current situation. <clears throat> I ran the carbohydrate model for two locations. First, I'll present Milton, and then I've run it for Clifton Park in the Capital Region. This is the output uh, this morning from the carbohydrate model, and I want to remind you of the different columns. The column with the first arrow, seven-day weighted average, is the most important column in terms of the impact of carbohydrate <clears throat> deficits on thinning. In those three columns that are colored the same, either blue from May 9th to May 12th or now green, is an indication of what kind of thinning we would expect. So if you would have put on chemical thinners during blooms, because this starts on May 6th, up through May 12th, <clears throat> you would have uh, had very mild thinning. But now today or tomorrow, it's forecasted on May 13th, to have very good thinning if you were to spray tomorrow. <clears throat> the next to the last column, the arrow points to <clears throat> the degree day calculation. And I've indicated that for this petal fall spray, we'd like to be somewhere around 110 degree days. It's predicted that on the 15th, we will arrive at that moment in time. And so 15th or 16th or 17th would be the optimum days to spray the petal fall spray for thinning 
if it's not raining. And so we have to work around the forecasted rain this weekend and either try to spray before that rain or wait it out. If you wait till Tuesday, May 17th, we'll be a little bit past the petal fall thinning window, but the chemicals will still work. But the reason I like to get that petal fall spray on before or we pass the 130 degree days is that so we can have about a week before we have to make the decision on the 12, 10 to 12 millimeter spray. If we wait till Tuesday, um, we'll probably be a week after that, a little bit outside the normal window for the 12 millimeter spray. And we might have to spray that one in less than seven days. I remind you that the last column gives my recommendation. So for the last several days, or starting on May 9th, we were suggesting if you thin to increase your chemical rate, but since May 11th and on through today and tomorrow, if you spray, we would suggest the standard chemical thinning rate. And that's what is printed in the Cornell Recommends. And I have some of those here a little later in the presentation. When you look at this same um, uh, data, but in graphical form, you see this carbohydrate balance curve. Starting at green tip in early April, it's been negative below zero the whole time. It, we finally had two days above zero uh, starting on May 7th and May 8th. But since then, it, we've had this very negative dropping of carbohydrate balance with the heat. And today on the 12th, we're about at a minus 35 on the seven day average. And tomorrow we're predicted to be even lower. I want to remind you that we like deficits to get thinning. The deficits that are below minus 60 are of a concern and we would be reducing rates or hesitant to spray. But in this range, which uh, in minus 30 to minus 40, it's actually a pretty good thing. Now the bo blue box indicates when the petal fall thinning window will open. I emphasize that you can spray before that and you can spray after that, but that's just the recommended window between 110 and 130 degree days. It won't start until day after tomorrow, which would be Saturday. And so Saturday, <clears throat> if it doesn't rain and you can get eight hours of drying would be an excellent moment to put on a petal fall spray, assuming that your bloom dates are similar to the ones I used in this uh, chart. <clears throat> now I want to contrast the Milton, the Lo Ulster County with Clifton Park. And I did not run a Columbia County just for sake of time, but it would be in between these two. So if you look at the Clifton Park, the curve on the top, you'll see the full bloom is later. I put it today. And the deficit has already started so that the full bloom period will be under a considerable carbohydrate deficit. And the thinning window for petal fall thinning won't really open up until Tuesday the 17th. So in the Clifton Park area, there's still time to put on ATS <clears throat> for bloom thinning. But if you're just going to be petal fall thinning, then you want to wait until the rain is past this coming weekend and look for Tuesday through Friday of next week. <clears throat> if you look down at the numbers below and we just focus on this column of degree days, we won't get to the 100 degree days till at least around Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. So that will be a way you can try to sort of judge when you're gonna get, get these uh, petal fall thinning sprays on. <clears throat> So I wanna give a couple of caveats. First, it's still too early, I think, to assess fruit set even in the lower Hudson Valley, but all indications are that it will be very good. But I think it's essential that before you put on any thinning sprays, you make an assessment of fruit set. If you're gonna spray some of the early blocks on Saturday before the rain, it will be on the early side to assess fruit set, but you'll be able to see it by seeing cluster or fruits with the stem turning up or those that have set. I just really don't expect there to be any problems with fruit set this year where you had bloom because of the really nice weather and the really good bee activity. But with that caveat, I wanna say that petal fall 
is going to be, a spray up petal fall is going to be a really important component of the full thinning program this year because temperatures are gonna be warm. I would pause to note that last year, the Hudson Valley had these hot temperatures closer to the 10 millimeter stage, but Western New York had the warm temperatures right at petal fall. And the studies that we were doing in Western New York, that petal fall spray under warm temperatures was just amazingly good. It was phenomenal. We essentially got almost all the thinning that we ever got that year from that petal fall spray. Because when we got into the 12 millimeter stage, it turned cold and the, we had carbohydrate surplus and that spray gave only a minimal amount of thinning. Thus, this year with the temperatures warm in the Hudson Valley at this petal fall timing, I think you'll get great thinning but you can't skip it because this might be the chance to really get almost all of it done. In blocks with a really strong set, we suggest a full dose of NA and seven. Now I wanna pause and say that if temperatures were to turn hotter than predicted, I might back that down a little bit, but be the day you spray, run the carbohydrate model and then follow the suggestion in the last column. I'm predicting that it's gonna say, apply a full normal dose. Alternatively, an NAD spray with seven is also very effective at this timing. And we've had renewed interest in NAD in the last few years and it's given great results. We expect very good thinning from either of those two things. Now this is a unique, not a unique year, but a special year in the sense that with temperatures in the mid seventies and low eighties, Maxell and seven at petal fall will just work fabulously as well. In cold years, we get almost nothing from Maxell at petal fall. But in warm years, we get very good thinning and it's especially useful on small fruited varieties, Gala and Empire and Snapdragon, but it's also really good on Fuji because on Fuji, we try to avoid NAA sprays because of the pygmy fruit problem and try to do that thinning strictly with a Maxell and seven program. Unfortunately on cold years, it doesn't work as good as we'd like, but this year it will be great. And then just to remind you that we're trying to time these sprays so they're about a week apart, the petal fall spray, the 12 millimeter, and then the rescue 18 millimeter spray if needed. And by going on degree days, you get about a week between each one. I wanna review briefly the chemical options at petal fall. <clears throat> I'm trying to time it when fruits are about five, to, the king fruit is about five to six millimeters. That often, almost always coincides with the 110 to 130 degree days. If you're a cautious person and you're afraid of thinning, you could just spray seven. It'll work to some extent and will help single down clusters. You can also spray amethyn by itself, but much more successful are the combinations of NAA and seven, which is the most common thing we use at petal fall, because it works better even in cool years. But in a warm year like this, I suggest you think about Max Allen 7 for the small fruited varieties and NAA and 7 for the large fruited varieties like Honeycrisp or Macintosh. If you want to thin without the use of Carbaryl or 7, then a combination of Max Allen and NAA has worked very, very well and then you can market your fruit as carbaryl free. Now we are looking at, still probably two years away, this new product called Metametron, or its trade name will be Brevis. I only put it here just to start to uh, have a start thinking about that product in a couple of years. <clears throat> I have a couple of suggestions for you. I think it's essential that you run the carbohydrate model the day you spray and then adjust your rate and possibly the timing if you find a better day, a day or two of, uh, away. The Malusim carbohydrate model exists both on the NUA website, but it also exists either as a computer app at malusim.org or as a phone app, which you can download for free. And if you just search Malusim, you can find that phone app and run it off your phone. I said earlier, but I wanna repeat it here just for emphasis. If we get in a situation where carbohydrate deficits are lower than minus 60, 
then there's caution. We shouldn't probably not thin that day, or if we do, redu use reduced rates. I want to buck up your confidence a little bit that at Petal Fall, over the 17 years we did this study, we never over thinned. So at Petal Fall, all thinners have a more moderate effect than they do at 10 to 12 millimeters. And th thus, on the positive side, they're very safe. So there's little risk of over thinning, even in a warm year when spraying these chemicals at Petal Fall. But with the warm temperatures, you have the possibility of getting a huge chunk of the thinning done in that one spray. So the carbohydrate balance model shows that there will be a significant deficit in the minus 30 to minus 40 range in the next few days. And I think that will help achieve very good thinning. I wanted to just throw this up again. I put this up at an earlier presentation, just what I would do if I was thinning Honeycrisp or Gala. I think both of them need um, a blossom thinning spray. I like ATS on Honeycrisp because it stimulates better return bloom than anything. Now for the benefit of those in the capital district who still might want to spray ammonium thiosulfate, the normal rate is 2.5%. We don't concentrate it. It's just two and a half gallons of ATS and hundred gallons of water. But with cool years, that hasn't worked sufficiently. And so we're suggesting 3%, but never higher than 3%. But this year with warm temperatures, I'm suggesting the two and a half rate. At higher temperatures, you will see more leaf margin burning or phytotoxicity. But it also burns the pistils of the flowers even more at high temperatures. And so you get greater thinning at higher temperatures. Hence the lower of those two rates. But for the Hudson Valley, where we're talking about petal fall with Honeycrisp, this three ounces per hundred plus one pint of seven, then follow that again at 12 millimeters with three ounces plus a pint of seven. If we get in a situation, which I don't expect we're going to this year, of needing a rescue thinning spray at 15 to 20 millimeters, then we switch to Max L and seven and oil. There is a new product called Exceed, which works well at those big temperatures. And if you get in that situation, you can talk to us or the valent people for a recommendation on how to use Exceed to get thinning when fruits are really big. With uh, Gala, I tend to prefer a Maxell based program to get better fruit size. At Bloom, often NA does really good or Amethyn. But starting at Petal Fall, the 64 ounces of Maxell, then another 64 ounces at 12 millimeters. And then, if needed, another 64 ounces with seven and oil at the 18 millimeter stage. Now I have here some suggestions. Um, this might get a little bit technical. I don't want to dive too much into the weeds, but I want to make sure that we're on the same page. Right now, it looks like as of this morning that the best window for the Hudson Valley Petal Fall Spray is Saturday through Tuesday, May 17th. But for the capital region, it's going to be later, May, Tuesday, May 17th through Friday, May 20th with Columbia County somewhere in between those two. We're suggesting that you use full rates, remembering that this is a safe time and full rates won't over thin. So if you like the parts per million, that's um, seven and a half parts per million of NAA on Honeycrisp, Gala, Snapdragon, et cetera, and a pint of seven. With Cortland, I don't like to put the seven in, just the NAA. But this year, because of the warm temperatures, Maxell and seven will probably do a great job, especially on small fruited varieties. I remind you that these rates and the ones published in the book Cornell recommends are dilute tree row volume rates. And let me explain that. For thinning, every block should have a calculated tree row volume. You should measure height and width and row spacing and calculate tree row volume and then calculate what we call a concentration factor. That is the tree row volume divided by the actual volume of water you spray per acre. That's a concentration factor. And here's an example. Let's suppose it's a fully grown tall spindle orchard that measures at tree row volume for dilute spray 200 gallons to the acre. But I'm only gonna spray half of that water, 100 gallons. Therefore, 200 divided by 100 gives me a concentration factor of two we use that concentration of factor of two to understand how much chemical goes in the tank. 
So we multiply the suggested rate above the three ounces of NA, let's say, for example, by the concentration factor to get the rate per acre. So the example I'm going to give is I'm going to spray Honeycrisp with three ounces of NA, but I multiply it by the concentration factor of two that I calculated earlier with three row volume divided by the volume of spray. That means I should put six ounces of NA in every hundred gallons. Now my sprayer is a 500 gallon sprayer. So I have five of these hundred gallon units. So I must multiply the six times five. I need to put 30 ounces of NA in the sprayer. If you don't calculate tree row volume and you just use the rates I put up there, you'd be putting in only 15 ounces per sprayer. So it's not the full rate that we're suggesting. So calculate tree row volume, then calculate a concentration factor based on the volume of water you're spraying, and then use that concentration factor to multiply by my suggested rates to get the amount per hundred. And then if you have a 400 gallon sprayer, it's times four or a 500 gallon sprayer times five to determine how much goes in the sprayer tank. Now, one last caution. We use that concentration factor for all the hormone type thinners, NAA, max cell, NAD, and future ones like metametron or exceed. But we don't generally use the concentration factor for carbaryl or for surfactants. Carbaryl, we don't use it because it has a limited solubility and it's only soluble at one pint per hundred. And so we just put one pint per hundred or five pints in a sprayer. And we do the same with surfactants. <clears throat> I wanna just present two slides of data showing that data that we took last year in New York showed that a relatively high crop load of gala made the most money. This is in US dollars. And you can see that across the bottom, we've generally set a crop load of about six for gala, but last year it showed that a crop load between eight and nine made the most money. Now last year was a wet year and so we got really decent fruit size. But my point is that I've done this repeatedly now for about 10 years, starting with the trials I did at Doug Minard's farm. And almost every year it shows that crop loads somewhere around eight with Gala are optimum. With Honeycrisp, the crop loads were slightly lower. And here we have to take into fact the return bloom issue. And so even though the optimum for economic purposes in that year of last year was 8.5. We suggest not going over a crop load of seven with Honeycrisp to make sure that we can get return bloom. I'll end with a couple of slides of suggestions again. Uh, I wanna repeat that before you spray, you have to assess the flower and set of each block. It's too early today to really assess fruit set. But if all the kings are set, it, the, all indications are you should use full rates. But once again, follow the carbohydrate model suggestion. Time your spray between the 110 and 130 degree days while you try to dance around the rainfall of this weekend, either a little bit ahead of the rainfall or right after the rainfall. I would suggest that you nozzle your sprayer differently for each of the sprays. For full bloom sprays with ATS, I like a uniform nozzle arrangement from top to bottom of the nozzle bank. But for petal fall, we switch to the traditional nozzling pattern of one third of the volume in the bottom half of the tree and two thirds of the volume in the top. As we go forward into the 12 and 18 millimeter, we generally are going to want to direct more spray to the top of the tree and less to the bottom. And when we get to 18 millimeters, we just don't spray the bottom. They almost always get over thinned. Lastly, if you want to include Regulate, um, that's a tradition with some growers. I don't recommend it on a hot year. On a cold year, when we have carbohydrate surpluses, then Regulate can help. But on a warm year where you have carbohydrate deficits, like what we're looking at at minus 30 to minus 40, I think Regulade will give you over thinning. So I would suggest you not put Regulade in this petal fall spray. Well, I wish you luck and hope that you can get these petal fall sprays on. 
But how are we going to know whether that spray did its job and whether we need another spray? This is where I plead with you all again to use the fruit growth rate model to measure fruitlets 50 degree days after that petal fall spray and then a second time 120 degrees after that petal fall spray and calculate how many fruits are falling off versus how many are staying. I'll offer my help to interpret the data if you take the measurements and send me the data or let me know your account number on malusim.org where it's the best way to do this. The suggested protocol is to count on five trees, the total number of flowers, and then tag 15 spurs and measure those five fruitlets on those 15 spurs in each of five trees. I emphasize for this purpose, we don't count bloom on one year wood. Now that introduces some problem in the final results, but if we do count them, it gives bigger problems in that we're counting fruits that we're trying to, that probably will not set and will thin off. Measure at 50 degree days after application and then remeasure at 100 and then enter the data in the malusim.org. I just put back up this slide. Um, this is from last year showing that if I sprayed at 200 degree days, this calculator here tells me when I make my first fruit diameter measurement. And that would be in a cool year like last year, one, two, three, four, five, almost six days after the spray. This year in a warm year, it's gonna be just three days after the spray but you can judge it based upon what was the degree days on the day you sprayed and then add 50. And so when you have 50 more than that day you sprayed, measure the first time and then at 100 after you spray, measure a second time. That's all I want to say today. And I think there's maybe four minutes for questions. If I really had 35 minutes, I'd be happy to talk about it further and discuss it with you. Hey, Terrence, can I make a couple of quick points? Sure. Okay, first is a reminder for everyone that full bloom, we define full bloom as 80% of the flowers open on the north or cool side of the tree. And I mention this because we often get very enthusiastic when we see the bloom and we might call that date a little too early. Also, because of the, the unusually cool weather that led up to bloom, our early risers such as uh, Pink Lady, Ruby Frost, uh, Ida Red Zestar started to pop their kings and then sort of went into a stasis because it was so cold. Uh, so we started the bloom with quite a variation, an unusual variation between varieties that of course, as soon as it turned hot, that was the great equalizer and that tightened everything up. So considering that for growers that are in Southern Ulster County and Orange County, I would look very carefully at your king set, just to make sure that the native pollinators did their job during those cool temperatures. I mean, we had some bright spots in temperature, uh, but the honeybees certainly weren't, wouldn't have been active, but native pollinators would be. So if, if there's gonna be a pollination issue, it's gonna be early blooming varieties in the Southern part of the Hudson Valley where the kings are out during the cold period. So I'd, I'd look very carefully uh, with that. Also, I want to mention that if you remember two years ago, I think it was in 2020, uh, as we led into the 10 to 13 millimeter stage, it looked like we did have, in fact, a tremendous carb deficit. And if you recall, we put together an emergency webinar with Terrence and because we were concerned, we, are, we were down minus 60 to minus 100 predicted micrograms of carbohydrate. So very dangerous territory. If that happens again, we will, Mike and I will put together another emergency webinar and let you know about it in case we have concerns. So be aware of that. Finally, uh, if you want to measure fruitlets and you need to buy a caliper, I like a caliper that's sold at Lowe's, the, the home store. Um, it's about 20 bucks. It's, a, it's called a carbon fiber caliper. It's got kind of wide, this, it's essentially plastic, a wide bevel on the jaws, and it's about 20 bucks, and it's very light, and it's compact. So it's a, it's a very nice caliper to use. I'll need to buy another one sometime later this week. I still remember, I think it's 20 bucks with that. That's all I want to say, other than a question for Terrence, and, and that is, what would weather conditions be like next week 
that might contribute to a severe carbohydrate condition. So we can keep an eye open for it. So there would be three things. It would be warm daytime temperatures above 80, but warm nighttime temperatures is equally, or maybe even more important. Anytime nighttime temperatures are above 60, there's a little bit of a concern and that gives big deficits. And I do see some high nighttime temperatures predicted. The third is cloudy conditions. So if I look back at the Hudson Valley, uh, the, the Milton data that I ran, you know, like May 5th to 6th, we had warm temperatures, but it's bright sunshine and there was not much deficit because the trees can handle warm temperatures with bright sunshine and make a lot of carbon. But temperatures in the 80s with cloudiness, where we have uh, light, light levels, it doesn't mean anything to you, but they go from about zero to 30 megajoules. But if you get down in the less than 15 megajoules, you always get big deficits if it's warm. So that's gonna be determined. I think it is gonna be somewhat cloudy next week. I don't think it's gonna be as nice uh, as it has been this week. And so these deficits could potentially get grow to a concerning level. Okay, thanks, Terrence. And we have one question in the chat and I think we have just enough time to, to deal with it. So the question is when there is freeze damage, but clearly two or three fruit lip per cluster, we should be doing petal fall thinning, correct? Yes. Uh, even with even with low counts per cluster, the risk of over thinning is very low. That's question. exactly right. And that's the beauty of the petal fall timing when you have this situation. If there's only two fruits left in a cluster, you can single that down to one and you'd essentially be done with thinning with this one spray when it's warm temperatures. The problem is in cool years, we try to do that and it never works quite as well. But this year is a fabulous year for the Hudson Valley to do petal fall thinning and get great results, even where you've had some winter damage. So I want to comment that um, the growers that have seen some winter damage are maybe facing this. And that's why I suggested not blossom thinning and waiting till this petal fall timing. But you've got to go look. And I'm, you know, we didn't know when we said that, that the weather would be so great for bee activity, but it was. And so I'm expecting those flowers that were in those damaged clusters to be set really well, and then they'll respond really well to this petal fall thinning. Terrence. Thanks. Oh, go ahead. Terrence, could uh, you talk a little bit about things, uh, biennial bearers like Macowans? Well, these biennial bearers, particularly Macowan, we have to spray at petal fall, or there's no way we can get repeat bloom. It's the same with Honeycrisp but Honeycrisp is even worse and we need the blossom spray. But Macowan, if you don't come in with a substantial rate of NAA and seven at petal fall, you won't get repeat bloom. So I love this fact that with Macowan on a warm year, we can come in with seven and a half parts per million of NAA and a pint of seven and just do a fabulous job on it. We'll probably still need to spray at 12 millimeters, but this spray is what's gonna help get return bloom on that and better fruit size on Macowan. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Pete. I think at this point, we're gonna to need to move on, but we're roughly on time. Uh, I think we will have some time at the end of the program to open up for additional questions. Uh, Dan, thanks. before we do, can I make just a, another quick comment? Sure. For the capital region, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, certainly Tuesday is still a, a little bit of a ways off. So um, do, do keep an eye on that carbohydrate balance when you get to that point. And also, uh, you know, there was some variability in terms of when I was looking at stone fruit damage, one orchard had pretty much uh, no winter damage. Another had pretty much 100% winter damage. So um, I don't think we got to temperatures that should really be too injurious to apple, but I do think it's, it's certainly worth taking a look closely at your varieties in the capital region before you go out and, and do your thinning. Okay, thanks, Mike, and thanks again to, to Terrence. And Mike, I'll turn the program over to you. All right, well, I just wanna introduce our next speaker. Uh, we have Dr. Monique Rivera, who's gonna be talking about insect management at Petalfall. And as Dan mentioned, Monique joined us just a little while ago. Before this, she was in California and we're happy to have her. So Monique, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, awesome. So let's jump right into it. Um... Still thinking about San Jose scale and thinking about this life, si this life cycle for management of this pest, I do think monitoring is key, especially if you have had history of this pest, because what we're really aiming to do here is to prevent the armored stage from developing, which is much harder 
effort to control. So to do this and to scout for this, um, really focusing on areas that have had a history of infestation is key. And using this simple black electrical tape upside down, sticky side up uh, to track the crawlers, which are pictured at the top right corner. So you wanna take a look at these about two times a week or have your consultant look at these about two times a week for detection. This is the easiest stage to control. If you are doing it yourself, a 10X hand lens is useful. So in terms of treatment options for this, um, I would advise on softer insecticides that focus on piercing sucking in insects. So Movento, as I'll mention a couple times throughout this talk at Petal Fall First Cover, this is actually uh, probably the most efficacious time to spray this product. There's also Savanto, which is a material that's currently considered be safe, but I don't know how long that will last as a title for this product. And then you can also use IGRs here. So I do want to also remind people that mating disruption is in development for this pest. Um, I'll be mentioning mating disruption throughout this talk. Um, the reason why I bother to mention this is because this is the best way to bulletproof yourself to get this established. Should there be more regulations and removals of uh, pesticide options? So next is a big one that we should all be thinking about in Apple at this time, um, and that's plum curculio. So you can see the adult uh, here on the left-hand side, and it is a very small weevil but it can do a lot of damage in apple. Um, so right now we're thinking about it ovipositing on the new fruit and causing the damage pictured in the middle um, titled oviposition damage. Um, and then these eggs will turn into larva, which will create feeding holes and a more serious damage throughout its development in the apple fruit. Um, you also will find possibly oviposition scars at harvest from this pest. So it's an important one to think about. And again, if you have a previous infestation with this pest, really key to think about this. So here's a zoomed in image of our plum curculio weevil. They're kind of gnarly looking up close, but I'm an entomologist, so I like to zoom in. Um, so these guys overwinter outside of the apple orchard. So they're going to start moving in around the time of bloom. And they're typically going to be predominantly on the edges at this point of invasion. Um, at bloom, they're, the adults are typically in the trees and you, you know, are not supposed to be spraying insecticide during this time for the pollinators. So uh, keeping an eye on it right at petal fall. Um, and that is also when oviposition is occurring and we want to try our best to prevent that oviposition as it creates more damage down the line on the fruit. Um, so this can, depend on seasonal temperatures. Uh, it will happen faster and the oviposition will get established faster the warmer we get. So the end of this week, it's supposed to get pretty warm. So this is a really key one to um, at petal fall, try to get taken care of. Infective, effective control for this is really considered pretty preventative. Um, and thinking about this from petal fall until the end of oviposition, which can overlap a little bit into the beginning weeks of June. Um, so the treatment options for this are Imidan, Actera, Avant, and Verdeprin. Um, so many of these also can control European sawfly if you are also having an issue with them. And throughout this talk, and I can give people a copy of it, you'll see that some of these same products are mentioned. So if your pest suite for the season seems to align, I would choose the one that covers the most of the pests um, to try to prevent additional applications for specific pests. Okay, another pest that's kind of difficult to manage and uh, pretty annoying is the tarnished plant bug. So these guys can tick up really quickly and um, a good pro tip would be to use a broadleaf um, specific herbicide in your row middles since they tend to like to hang out there uh, throughout the year. Um, but their feeding on buds and flower parts at this time of the season can really cause possible aborted fruit. And so it is a cause for concern if your blocks have a history of this um, insect being there. They can have two to three generations per year and they're typically active only um, or they're active in the early season only on warmer days. So again, the end of this week is a perfect time to go out and take a look for them. Um, monitoring, which not many people do, but if you are specifically trying to get uh, your IPM program in check with monitoring included for pests like this, 
a white sticky panel trap along the border is recommended, which you would set at silver tip and then one trap every three to five acres. So the cumulative trap uh, averages and action thresholds if you are using the trap are three tarnished plant bags average over the five traps. Um, and that's the conservative action threshold. Um, and then up until bloom, you know, you really wanna focus on this during this early stage when the fruit is also super sensitive. Um, later in the season, post bloom, five to eight tarnished plant bugs per five traps is considered a high population and probably needs an additional spray. So unfortunately, the treatment suggestions for these are pyrethroids. This can flare European red mite. So uh, hopefully these are in check and you see them later in the season uh, so that this isn't another insecticide going on at this time of the year. But um, if you have a specific issue with this pest, you can feel free to follow up with me and we can discuss further. So again, with the mating disruption, so I wanted to mention the now is a good time, past couple of weeks has been a good time to think about hanging ties if you're gonna focus on establishing this in your blocks. Um, and so the technology is really becoming somewhat easier to use in the sense that we're uh, combining pests and also there are less dispensers per acre. So for example, there's a newer product called Sidetrack by Trace A, where you're looking at only 32 dispensers per acre. This is best for larger blocks that are 10 plus acres. And we still have a lot of questions to answer about this in New York. So I want to remind everyone of this. Um, and this is high on our priority list to get um, thought of and taken care of so that we can advise. But so as you're establishing this, what does the spray program look like? How many years does the spray program need to overlap if you want to fully establish this and trust in this? Um, and then again, dispersal of pheromone under varying conditions. So while this is successfully used on the West Coast, our conditions here are quite a bit different. Okay, so oblique banded leaf roller and other internal leps for this slide. So this is what the larva of the oblique banded leaf roller looks like. And so for this uh, scouting wise, you want to examine bud clusters. And when you're at 3% larval infestation of those bud clusters, that is your treatment threshold. And suggestions for this, so any of the BT products would work for any of the LEPs. And then also Delegate, Altifor, Xrel, and Verdeprin. Um, and so like I've mentioned earlier, these are also good options for the other internal LEPs if you see some early season activity. Um, you can count on these to have cross efficacy. Lastly, let's talk about aphids. So the first picture with the blue background is the woolly apple aphid, and then on the bottom, the rosy apple aphid. So it's time to start examining uh, clusters, terminal leaves um, for the wingless adults, and uh, pretty quick action threshold here. So one infested cluster, you should be thinking about treating for these because they can take off really quickly. Um, and especially with the woolly apple aphid, we want to get to that before it starts um, covering over with the wooliness that it will later in the season. So again, the Movento um, petal fall at first cover, Savanto assail are the treatment uh, suggestions for that. And so with that, that's pretty much the insects that I am discussing today. And you can follow up with me via email, or if we have time for questions, I can try to answer your questions. All right. Thank you, Monique. I don't see any questions in the chat box at the moment, but if anybody does, uh, feel free to type them in there, or you can also unmute yourself and ask Monique directly. And barring any questions, um, I'll turn things back over to Dan. Okay, thank you very much, Monique. Excellent presentation. Thank you, Mike. So next up we have our Carrot Cox, and Dr. Cox is based in Geneva and is our extension plant pathologist, and we're pleased to have him uh, available to us today. Carrot, if you can share yep. your screen. and it looks, oh, yeah, we can, yeah, let's share that screen. Oh no, this will stop other screen sharing. Yep, I'll do it. Now it's happening. I suppose it's sharing. All right, here we go. Others can see the screen. Great, all right, here we are. Where are we? We're going to be focusing on apple scab and fire blight, and it's a weekend for the for the two of those particular problems. I've got to finish this so I can get back on the sprayer to get all of our stuff done. Um, let's see. So far, a pretty mild winter. Um, you know, November to early January had these nice spikes of hot hot days in the middle of February. Some cold, 
and it sort of just sort of stayed prolongingly cold for the longest bit of time. But it's shaping up to be a, I'm thinking, a, a fairly light scab season. Um, we'll see. Um, green tip around the end of March, uh, or middle of March, April. You know, a lot of cold days, these short bursts of hot weather. Not too many hard spring freezes unless you've got stone fruit or in a particularly low-lying area. Really slow start. Now it's really going, and it's almost gone for apple scab. Not a lot of snow cover. A lot of rain at green tip. And I really think that was part where the early season urea and copper was uh, important, but also challenging because it stayed wet in our blocks for quite some time. It's just now starting to seem like I can actually drive in them uh, with a tractor um, without any problems whatsoever. In eastern New York, a ton of possibilities for ascospore ejection, well, maybe four. Um, Temperatures are either like strange, it depends on the site, but they're either could be like, oh, not warm enough, or the leaf wetness was just not long enough. But anyway, in western New York, it looks like some of the bigger ones were around uh, 414, about 20% ejection, you know, 426, about another. And then the biggest one, I would say, and we'll look at some charts in a minute, but from about 5.2 to 5.7, this is the big apple scab infection event of the season. And, you know, um, with the scattered thunderstorms, you may be thinning, you may be spraying for fire blight, and might even be putting in things for apple scab as well, because depending on how these little thunderstorms play out uh, over the weekend, whether it's going to be Saturday night, whether it's going to be Saturday morning, um, you could have a, an apple scab event going on as well. They seem to be changing that. It looked like the scattered thunderstorms about two days ago were more towards Sunday, now they're thinking some on Saturday. So even if you got a recommendation for me, you should look and see what the weather is saying today. Um, this is kind of what things look like over the um, the early part of the season, 414, you get a nice ejection, but uh, there's just not enough leaf wetness. And that happened at places. It's not always the case. Sometimes you might have, depending on where you were. Oh, 426, great. Oh, this is like a pretty decent one. Sometimes it was too low, but in many instances, this is probably a fairly decent period. It's just a little nine hours of leaf wetness, not too much, but a lot of spores in the air. Um, this is sort of the big one, we would say, uh, 21 with a bunch of stuff happening a little bit over the days. And it's just from May 2nd to the 7th. It was just a, a monster um, apple scab event, no matter how you look at it. So that's sort of the, the big one for the season. Right now, um, primary is over, but uh, if this act stuff like this is showing up on your NUA or your RIMPRO or whatever you're using, it might be time to think about going in and making sure you're protected for the weekend. Um, you had a lot from this one here going all the way to the 7th, so all that rain probably uh, and leaf wetness probably removed your residue. Yeah, probably trying to do a little bit of a protection, particularly as you go into petal fall, things get a little more exciting with all the other diseases. And with that, let's move into fire blight. Um, you've had a pretty reasonable March, April bloom, short bouts of warm weather, almost hot. No, no, now things are going into late bloom or prolonged bloom and um, might not have flowers on the trees, but it's a pretty intense fire blight type situation. Now, why am I talking about Western New York? And what seemed to happen in Western New York in the last two years, we had sort of a cold bloom period with these massive spikes, particularly also in New England area, when you get sort of a, a little bit further uh, north, you get these cold blooms and then like, oh no, a lot of warm, hot, dry weather. And that's when things really got ugly for a lot of Western New York and in some places in New England as well. You got these devastating shoot blight epidemics and it's like it's super dry it's a paddle foam yeah maybe there was a thunderstorm but nothing happened and there's dust everywhere but um a lot of us have looked into the situation and you know there's still dew in the grass and there's still humidity in the canopy and there's still water from an application and any one of these things and particularly water from an application dries fire blight in places like washington state where it gets pretty much dry the whole time but somehow they get it so as we're going into this really hot weather at petal fall uh, don't disregard fire blight, finish strong in this particular instance. And um, let's take a look at what we're looking at. This is what the situation kind of looked like in Western New York. I was ah, freezing cold, oh, petal fall, wham, this big monster things. And it would just come in and wipe out stuff, even if flowers were off the trees. Um, here's where you're kind of looking like now. It is like, um, it's definitely code red at this particular point as you're sort of moving into these really hot, 
scenarios. And, you know, this is creeping up as the forecast changes, and it doesn't seem to be backing down. You're getting really high levels in the Cougar Blight. You're getting excessive EIP. And um, the golden ticket would be to get this stuff right on before that next scattered thunderstorm. Give yourself the maximum level of protection as the as the bloom um, period begins to end. Um, it's kind of what it looks like in sort of a projection looking out. You're really right at this like, oh, we're off. Are we done? Is there a rat tail bloom? Is there a one hanging on flower? Do I have a young block that's pushing? And if so, um, it's time to really uh, sort of get those things and make sure they're clean. And like bloom has been sort of cool. So this is kind of like what we saw in other areas of the state the last two years and that led to problems. So uh, definitely finish strong. Could be hot and dry, could be a part Saturday. The storms could come on Saturday morning now, depending on where you're looking at. Could be hot with rain. Um, finish strong. If you can, you know, if the rains are now coming Saturday morning, don't, don't wait. Um, get that strip and a fungicide on because there could be a little bit of scabs sneaking through, even though primary is over. Um, I'm thinking um, if you want to go blossom protect, go today if you're organic or go Friday and don't put a fungicide with it. Um, there are fungicides you can mix with it and there's a little alert about what to do on the blog. But in general, if you want this to work really well, put it by itself. Um, you know, if you're going strep or you do your, oh, you do your uh, fungicide afterwards, unfortunately, this one works best by itself. And if you go strep, you can probably put the two together. Um, moving into shoot growth, if it's going to be really hot at the end of petal fall and things are moving, uh, might want to consider the uh, larger uh, six ounces per hundred gallons of ProHex for the older trees. And, you know, if you have really young things, even one year old, this is the sort of recommendation that's rolling across the entire country to protect against young blocks. Two ounces of the ProHex and one ounce of ActiGuard per hundred. This doesn't seem to impact even young high density trees. It's well liked in Michigan. Looks like the genetics say that both of these things boost up um, defenses a little bit. And this, this one even will even thicken cell walls just a bit as well. So, um, you know, may not want to do more than one ounce because it gets quite expensive, but this is a good wreck for, for young trees and fire blight. Okay, now that you're going into petal fall, um, things get crazy. The potential for injury gets really high if we have hot, wet weather that's sort of cool, but we're not having that. So I don't think you're going to hurt yourself with Captan this year. But now, um, particularly in the eastern part of the state, as you go south, um, this is when you're going to run into the other things, the Marcinina. And this one you really like can be managed pretty well with a scab fungicide. It's a group sevens like the Miravis and Aprovias and the Lunas and the Maravons work pretty well on that. If you have bitter rot, the, the group threes and group elevens, the, you know, the various QOIs and the DMIs work really well. And then even though, wait, why am I worried about fly spec sooty blotch? Well, it turns out that a lot of the early infections of fly spec sooty blotch happen right at that petal fall first cover timing. And so this is your time to bring in the uh, the fancy fungicides as well. They're going to give you a little bit of protectant and a little bit of kickback if you happen to put one on after a rain. And um, at this part, I think it's time to go strong with all the different programs. Just because you don't want scab and you definitely don't want this stuff. And this is where you can shut a lot of it down. Sort of recommending a sort of strong program with the single sites at that petal fall to first cover. You can just put them with one protectant, or if you have something else in there, um, they're going to be fine. Um, you got your SDHIs, your DMIs, and your QRIs. And depending on which one of these things you have, you could uh, select your products appropriately. If you got more fly spec sooty blocks, lean towards these. If you have more marcinina, if, lean towards those. If you're organic and you have marcinina, it's probably time to start crying. Um, and, uh, you know, if you get heavy rains, you can put on another one, but I don't think we're going to see that for a while. And, you know, you can keep, once you really do a good job of cleaning up at petal fall, you can keep these things at bay most of the summer. We've done some studies to show that one good petal fall first cover application of a fancy single site fungicide will pretty much make fly spec sooty blotch disappear for the entire season, and you can extend your intervals um, as you start to approach harvest. If it turns to a wet summer, you're going to want to back this down and, you know, and as you get right towards the end, find that single side fungicide with a low PHI, something like Maravon, something like um, Steen, and then you put that guy right on right before harvest, maybe a Luna product, and that will sort of give you that last bit of a post harvest push to keep those fruit looking good as they go into storage. And I'm going to go ahead and stop there and we'll let Dan finish this up. Thank you very much, Carrick. Appreciate your great presentation.
Okay, we are on time and I think we could have time for uh, some questions from the floor. Before I open the floor to questions, I want to mention that for the Hudson Valley, we are going to have a return to in-person fruit set meetings. They will be held on Tuesday, May 17th. The Ulster County meeting will be at 9 a.m. and it will be in, in uh, John Weed's uh, beautiful new winery and cafe. Um, and then in two o'clock in the afternoon, we'll be at the um, almost as charming classroom at the Hudson, uh, Hudson New York uh, Cooperative Extension office where we've been in the past. So uh, the way we're going to do it is uh, Russ Holtz, Wynn Kogel and myself will be scouting the entire valley on Monday for fruit set. And then we, we will report to you what we see and recommendations for how to handle uh, what we see for fruit set. So uh, please put it on your calendar and, and please uh, attend. If you can, uh, we will try to make the meeting as compact as possible because I know everybody's gonna be also spraying at that time as well. And with that, I will open the floor to any questions. And what you can do is simply unmute and ask your question. Okay, I do have some questions in the chat box. Uh, if relative humidity goes above 90% tomorrow uh, and rain late Saturday through Monday, tons of flowers open, wait until Saturday and rely on 24 hour kickback for the high relative humidity, might have to go out again on Tuesday with strep two. Carrick, any comment about Yeah, Yeah, I think I would try to get it on now. And if you still have lots of flowers and it's still remaining hot, on Monday, Tuesday, and it looks like it's gonna be raining, you might want to make sure those get covered again. Um, just because, I don't know, with all this, if we do get a lot, you're almost done with fire blight, and it would be really uh, it'd be really scary. In this case, you could go back maybe on Monday or Tuesday with something else if it does get cooler more quickly. Um, you know, maybe do your strep now since it's the, you know, the end of days, and then you, you know, you could like get that last little bit of a, Petal fall uh, casugamycin. If you're like, oh no, I'm really kind of worried about that as you move into petal, as you move into sort of petal fall, just to get that last little bit of protection. Um, or you could you could try a softer product. They all work going to work pretty well. You just want to make sure you get that stuff covered. If there's not a lot of water, you could probably go softer. If there is going to be more rain earlier the next week and it's still in the high 60s, you might want to protect them with something a little bit stronger. In that particular instance, um, if you do do casugamycin and you've got New York one, it that that last application is a perfect time to pick up the uh, serendipitous bitter blister spot um, control. You know, if you happen to ever have a blister spot, I don't think blister spot's going to be a problem this year with all the dry weather. But uh, yeah, you might have to go back again on Monday if it's still staying extreme in that particular case. Uh, thank you very much, Carrick. Question. Go ahead. Uh, that 48 hour efficacy on strep, is that because we're assuming other flowers are open or is that just kind of what you get? Um, I think you'll get it on the currently open flowers. If something else opens up afterwards, even a rat tail, it's just gonna be, it's probably not gonna be protected. Now, if you get the Regulade, you might be able to get a little bit of uptake into nearly open flowers and um, be okay. Okay. Yeah, and you know, if you go on with a uh, with your ProHack stuff as well, if something does escape, you're already starting to shut it down. And um, I suspect the more active the tree is, the more active it's going to metabolize that ProHex and give you your best protection buck for it, or best shoot shrinking, you know, that type of stuff. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for your question. Do we have any other questions from the floor? We did have another one in the chat box, Dan. Yep, go ahead, Mike. Uh, Kevin Bowman was asking if we can't get ATS, how much NAA for bloom thinning? Darren did respond there, 10 parts per million for bloom thinning, which should work out to that four ounces per hundred adjusted for the tree row volume. Very good. Thank you, Kevin, for your question. Do we have any others? I do see Terrence speaking. He was muted, though. But just a quick comment to help uh... Kevin, be comfortable with that. 
when we've done these timing studies, the bloom timing is even less sensitive to thinners than the petal fault timing. That's why we're trying to wait to five to six millimeters. Thus, 10 parts per million at bloom is very safe. Thanks, Terrence. Okay, it looks like we're gonna wrap up. So I would like to thank our speakers, Terrence, Monique, and, and Carrick for excellent presentations. I would like to also thank our webinar sponsor, Valent Company, uh, for their generous support. And with that, Dan, if I could jump in real quick again. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, for the Saratoga growers, I am planning to do an in-person fruit set meeting as well. Um, we'll see how things shake out. So expect the time and location to be announced at a later date. What I'm hoping to do is hold it somewhere with Wi-Fi connectivity. And Terrence, if you're willing, I'd like to zoom you in so we could get your, your thoughts on, on what I'm seeing in the region. So we'll get that announced that would probably sometime next week. Okay, very good. Uh, this has been recorded. We will upload it to YouTube and we'll send out an e-alert uh, with the in-person meeting announcements as well as the YouTube link uh, just as soon as we have it available, hopefully later today. And with that, if there is anything else, then we'll close the meeting. Thank you very much for attending and have a great day out there.